Welcome to Home Gym History. My name is Rob, and I am going to speak with David, better known as Indiana Stones, in just a minute. To give you a little background, he's an ordinary guy like me, but he became a man on a mission to find the forgotten and lost lifting stones of his country of Ireland. These aren't just any old stones. These are specific, like, stones that have historical context to them. They may have been sacred. They may have been a rite of passage. And he's been traveling on the weekends and after hours when he's not working his normal day job to find them and lift them. Before we get to David, though, real quick, please, if you've never stopped by my website, Vintage Weights, pgh.com please head there and take a look around i've been working on it adding some features and you can dig even further into strength history by stopping by also this episode is produced as always by garage gym radio the official broadcasting channel of home gym con Home Gym Con is coming up in 2025, the last weekend of June. You can save tickets to the one and only gathering for home gym owners, Home Gym Con, by using code VINTAGE. Save a little cash on your tickets to Home Gym Con with code VINTAGE, and I hope to see you there. Now let's get to David. Rob, thanks for having me. I'm going to appreciate it. <laughs> Absolutely. I've been following you on Instagram for a while, and I'm, I'm fascinated with this mission of yours, this, this quest, this adventure. So uh, how did you get on this mission, this quest to find these old stones and lift them? I suppose it depends how far back you want to go with this. Um, yeah. Really, I suppose it, the, the, the stones part of the fitness journey started oh, through COVID and the COVID lockdowns, which were like, really strict over in Ireland probably way too strict, you know, we were in like a 2K lockdown of mm -hmm. the house and we couldn't go anywhere. So like I was competing in a kettlebell sport for my country for, for seven years. Um, and before that, so like I was going to the gym three, four days a week and all my gym equipment that I needed was there, all the kettlebells all the barbells, everything I needed was in the gym. So I didn't have much stuff at home. So the gyms then got shut through COVID and just through pure necessity and kind of, um, SAS kind of like, you know, adapting and overcoming. I was like, what can I use in, that's in my house? So like I met my wife in our college and she has some lovely um, stone carvings on the backyard. So I was just like, okay, that's a weight. I can pick that up. So I started <laughs> picking up the stone carvings and just taking out my frustrations on these stone carvings and throwing them off the ground and putting holes in the back garden. And How did your wife feel about this? She wasn't really happy about it at first. <laughs> yeah. but, hey man, if that's what you need to get through this, look, you do you, you know? So yeah, I was just yeah. using those and I weighed them at 61 and 72 kilos and Mm. Just started lifting them. And then I kind of fell in love with the functionality. And I know functionality is kind of a worn out trope, um, especially nowadays. But I mean, I think probably the most functional movement you can do as a human being is to be able to pick something up off the ground. You know, it's pretty basic. So mm -hmm. to be able to pick something awkward off the ground, it kind of it gives you confidence kind of in general day to day life. You know, it's like picking up your kids or picking up like shopping or picking up whatever off the ground. You know, you know you're strong in that movement. And I started to really enjoy the physicality of it. And then I became aware of the rogue fitness documentaries that were made about the uh, stone lifting in Scotland and in Iceland. Yeah. And yeah. the Bass Wheaton is being. And they're, like, if, if, if you haven't seen them. Um, oh, they're wonderful. Them. Yeah. Full and Sturker they, is the yeah. Icelandic one. Yeah. And um, I've had a previous episode a while ago of Home Gym History with uh, Kurt a strongman come came on and we went through the history of strongman implements and you know we dabbled into the atlas mm. stone and stone lifting but yeah. nothing like you so yeah the full sturker documentary and all of those things are a great primer but then that's talking about iceland and scotland and True. you're located in ireland so then yeah. how do you start tracking down just differentiating between what's just a regular old stone and what has some historical context sure so um like I went to Scotland and I lifted those lifting stones and I became aware of the Fina stone, which to me was a very, very important kind of turning point. Um, because like we were brought up in stories of the Fina and Fiamma Cool and the Celtic cycles back in school, you know, we, this is part of our history and our lore and our culture. So I heard there was a Fina testing stone in Glen Nine. There was like mythology and reality kind of combining. So I went to Scotland and lifted that. And it was a very kind of almost spiritual moment for me. It was like, that's kind of getting in touch with my, ancient warrior past, you know, and my Celtic warrior past. And I was like, that was fantastic. So when I heard it was a Fina stone in Scotland, I was like, there has to be something to learn. I mean, like we are the Fina in Ireland. That's where the Fina came from. So I started to research. So 
because I was thinking, like, you know, there's Iceland, you know, on this side, and there's Scotland on this side, and there's like the Basque region in Spain just down here. So it's this little triangle. We're in the middle. And I was like, we can't just be the missing link. There has to be something yeah. here. You would you think know, there'd so, be something in Ireland, uh, yes. You know, it'd be more unusual if there wasn't, you know, because geographically so that yeah, geographically that's a great alone, point. Geographically yeah. alone, but then like we have like all the standing stones, the cromlechs, the dolmens, the megaliths, you know, all those ancient four or five thousand year old sites, stone sites, stone circles. I was like, there has to be something here. It's just it's just probably buried deep. So the bit the research began. I started on um online actually. What does anybody do? You go to Google. Yeah. So I typed in Irish lifting stones <laughs> and came up with um, Dr. Connor Heffernan, a professor up in Ulster University. I and love so Connor's he's... work. Oh, Connor's great. Connor's a wonderful guy. physical culture study is one of my favorite websites, his website. Yeah. And I've been meaning to have him on the show. So yeah, I, uh, I'll send him an email and see maybe having you on the show. I can, I can get oh, him on definitely, next. Definitely. Yeah. I have a chat with him as well. He's such a cool guy. And oh, like, it was mad that he, he, he started that for me because he had written about the possibility of there being lifting stones in Ireland and um, through all references on folklore references. But mainly from the reference from Limo Flaherty, the famous Irish essay, essayist and writer, short story writer. Mm-hmm. Um, and he gave a couple of snippets of Liam's story called The Stone um, in an online piece that he'd written. So oh. I became enamored. I was like, hold on a second. Wait, so there's this piece that this guy wrote on one of the Aran Islands, which is just off the west coast of Galway. I was like, he was talking about a stone lifting and like the history of stone lifting. And I was like, hold on a second. OK, so the culture is here. I don't think he's just making this up. I mean, the story's written back in the 1920s, you know? Mm. So I was like, okay, that must be a real thing. So then I started Inish Morstone. I started really, really going in depth on that. And I found that you're aware of Peter Martin, who found all the Scottish lifting stones. Peter Martin was the man who brought back the culture in Scotland. Mm-hmm. Um, Peter Martin was talking to a woman on the island of Inish Moor, um, and he was on a Reddit forum, and he was just asking questions. And Peter is de- deceased now, about six or eight years. But uh, this woman called Fiona said, look, Peter, yeah, there's, there is lifting stones in Ireland. There's one in Inishmore. I live in Inishmore, a place called Kirk Copper. And there's a, a lifting stone here that uh, Limo Flaherty wrote about. He based his story, the stone, on this stone. And it's sitting in a in a little hollow over here. Um, I hope this helps. So I was like, what? Are you telling me that this isn't a story? Like, this is this is reality? You know, so. Yeah, it's an actual physical thing. This is an yeah. actual physical thing that said it's based on yeah. this stone here that we have in this in this village. So I just went straight over to Inish Man that weekend. I called my friends. We went up in a camper van up to Galway, got over on the, the ferry and cycled the 25 minutes to this place in, in Inish Moor and found that, that lifting stone, you know. Um, it was just an amazing experience, you know. And even the finding of it was so unusual because, like, you're on the Aran Islands and, like, the Aran Islands is just a, a, a rock, you know, it's just stone. It's just absolutely just stone and boulders and rocks strewn all over it. There's barely any patch of grass. It's a really, really hard place to live. And bred some very, very hard people over there and back over the years. But I was like, how am I going to find a rock in a in a, in an island full of rocks? So how am I going to know which one I want? <laughs> you know, you know, it's a very, very it's needle, a needle in a haystack. Yeah. She said it was on this particular path. So I, I, I went down to this pathway. And again, even on this pathway, like it's a boulder strewn pathway. So there's, there's just stones everywhere. It's like, there's a hundred thousand stones here. How am I meant to know? But as I was walking down and I had the book with me and I was reading Liam Flaherty's story and I was immersed in the story then. You know, you're looking around, you're seeing, okay, yes, this is this, and this is this. And he talked about walking through here. And then it was like in a little hollow in a patch of grass, um, the sunshine shone upon the particles of meek and the surface of the stone. Mm-hmm. And I was walking down this pathway and I saw in a field of gray limestone, this round pink granite boulder, um, and it was like, that has to be it. It stands out like a sore thumb. You know, it's it's pink in a field of grey. And like, that has to be it. You know, I mean, I didn't know for sure that it was it. I took a, I, I guess, because like there was a little small plinth beside it. There was a couple of what looked like warm up stones beside it. It was in a patch of grass. It stood out really, really, like the colour wise, everything, the shape of it stood out. Mm-hmm. I came back four weeks later with a friend of mine, Jamie Garion from Scotland. And um, I found a, a man giving a walking tour and... I asked him, I said, look, excuse me. I said, do you know anything about the lifting stone down there? And he said, yeah. I said, that's the Mulan Port Vale on Dune. That's the lifting stone on the island, the one that Limo Flaherty wrote about. Wow. So I was like, there you go. And, you know, verification of an Irlander. That's the first lifting stone on Ireland final. So it just went from there. Then I, that, that was the first one. And like, I was so yeah. proud, Rob. I was like, I was so fucking proud. I found a yeah. lifting stone. Ireland, you know I watched I mean? the video of you lifting it. It's one Did of the you? first, you have it pinned on your Instagram. Yeah. And if anyone, any listeners go, I'll drop a link to David's Instagram. It's underscore Indiana stones underscore. And yeah, it's uh, watching you lift it. It's no easy feat. 
That's oh, for I mean, sure. Like, I was two and a half years building up to that lift. I wow. visited that stone five times. You know, the first time I went to that stone, the first time I found it, I couldn't break the ground with it. Um, mm. Second time, four or five weeks later with my friend Jamie, I got it about maybe ankle height off the ground. I came back six months later, I got it up to almost to machines. So, I mean, I built it up bit yeah. by bit, almost like the young fella does in the story. You know, he tossed it, he said he tossed it every night until he became stronger as a stone. And I felt like I kind of became that story over the past two and a half years that I tussled with it and wrestled with it and visited many times. And it's a long old spin from here. It's a full day trip, you know. Mm-hmm. But um, just to get there the last time and to know that the, the training I put in the past two and a half years, that I could finally stand up with that stone. Because I said, if a man could stand with that stone, he was a phenomenon of strength and the people mm-hmm. talked about him. And he was to be spoken of for generations to come, you know. So it was a wonderful feeling to do that after many, many years of, of training. I think it's fascinating the differences between the natural stones because uh, atlas stones are uniform yeah. for the most part, you know, yeah. the the sphere, but seeing the differences, you know, seeing you on a beach lifting a a very slick, you know, very mm-hmm. slippery looking stone versus kind of a jagged looking stone versus some of the taller ones that are almost as yeah. tall as you and you're basically yeah. you're it's like a bear hug trying to <laughs> you yeah. know wrestle it basically. Um, oh. So what uh, can you speak to that at all? What are some of the different sure. uh, techniques, if you will, with natural yeah. stones? Yeah, it's, uh, it's something I just picked up on, you know, as, as I've found them, because there's so many different ways of lifting them over here. Like, you know, for such a small country, we had so many different ways, different stones, different types of lift. Um, a lot of the stones over here, they're very, very large. So it's like, it's what they call a have lift. So it's just like the one in the Faroese Islands, you know, um, it was just to break the ground with it, what we call getting the way free. So the way free means the wind under it. So if oh, you can just okay. get the wind under the stone, um, it's a valid lift. A lot of them, because like some of the ones, the way free ones you're talking from, 180 up to about 250, 270 kilos of mm. weight, which is a fair big weight. You know what I mean? If you say <laughs> like 250 kilos on a deadlift is a decent deadlift, you know? That's a pretty decent deadlift. And you're talking about something that's not calibrated. It's not ergonomic. Mm. It's not knurled. It's in a field. It's wet. It's slippery. You're in mud or in grass or on a beach or on sand. And you're trying to pick this thing up um, with very little warm up a lot of the time. So I say to people, it's like go out, walk into a gym and attempt your max deadlift without any warm up um, and yeah. no job and see what that feels like. And, and then that's what lifting these stones is, you know. A lot of the times you're going to lift a stone off the ground that's easily 170, sometimes more, much more than that. And you're trying to pick that thing up from the grass, you know. And again, it's yeah. like you're not picking it up from a deadlift bar, you know. No, it's, no. That, that, it's that, not that, 17 that, inches in the air. It's, yeah. It's on the ground, you know. So you're mm-hmm. getting down lower and your surroundings dictate the lift. You know, your mm-hmm. surroundings dictate the lift always. Then you have the shape, like you said, the shape of the stone. So you have the shape of it. It could be very very sometimes the, the weight is almost like two thirds of the way up the stones you, you have to find the center of gravity so then like that takes a little bit of time to find the center of gravity then one side could weigh more than the other so you're putting more effort into one side so i mean you have to have a like very very strong trunk and core and then you have to texture of the stone you know the texture of the stone it could be like i said jagged really really rough and like sometimes that, that's a lot easier to get a grip on like some of the jagged stones are granite stones especially and um, what, what we call woolly stones over here, granite stones are are like that, the dense crystals, so they're very, very easy to get a, a grip on, you mm-hmm. know, whereas you have then like a polished limestone or marble, like you've kind of mar- marble stones, some of them up, up the west of Ireland, which are just like as smooth as a marble. And then you're trying to pick something up that's incredibly difficult to get a grip on. So then it's mm-hmm. all forearm strength, you know, so it's just been a wonderful um adventure through finding these stones and, and lifting them and then figuring out what's the best way to lift that and then training that at home and trying to go back and get better and it's awesome absolutely so much fun you know i i enjoy it myself i take my children hiking awesome. uh, quite a bit here in pennsylvania we have a lot of wooded area forest trails and actually this afternoon after i get off with you that's what i'm doing is taking my children on a hike and inevitably i uh, my eyes are scanning looking for uh you know a stone that looks interesting to pick up my children like it because if i pick it up maybe there's some bugs and insects underneath it <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh and we go to some frequent trails and even though they're not historical in a sense like the ones you're finding i've gotten to kind of know that oh 
I remember this one or I'll go try That's this one. one. Yeah. And, yeah. but I'd love to travel some and try some of these historical ones. Now the Mullen stone, that was the first one you mm -hmm. talked about Sure. Yeah. since then. I mean, that's, it sounds like that's your favorite. That's the, uh, that's, it's very special to you, but have there it been is. other favorites? Have there been any since then that, or in the time that you were training for that one that you found that would just, you know, stood out it, to it, you? It'll be ever, it'll be so hard to top that because I've, I've written a book about this and mm -hmm. like the first chapter and the last chapter are about the Manon stone and because it was the very first found and we didn't know it was there, the culture here. So like, you know, I found that, you know, that was, that was the beginning of the journey. And then because there was a the beautiful story about the, the different levels of being able to lift it, you know, mm -hmm. if you could get the wind under it, you know, it was a great day in any young man's life. You can get it to your lap, you're, you know, a hero equal to the best. But if you get it to your chest, you're a phenomenon of strength. And the way they had the levels of manhood and you know, all that kind of stuff around the stone and the beautiful story written by Limo Flaherty and then like telling the rabbit hole of Limo Flaherty's work and reading a lot of his short stories and all of that. And then, then going back and the finding it and the lifting it and, getting better and finally standing up with it there. And the amount of people who have visited it since as well, it's just been absolutely incredible. I mean, it really is the jewel in the crown of Irish stone lifting. You know, I think it's, it's, it's definitely my favorite, but there is other ones that just have phenomenal stories as well. You know, there's some of the ones up in the North of Ireland that have like mythological toys, you know, back to like uh, Coo Cullen and Fiona mm -hmm. Coon and these, these, these giants of Irish mythology and culture. Um, and then like, some of them go, go back to our ancient festivals, like festivals like Lunasa. And there's, the, the stories are just incredible. I mean, I guess I could sit here and talk for about the next six hours about all these stories. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, well, they're, they're, just, they're just amazing, you know? Did any of these stories come to you uh, easier than others, you know? Sure. Let's, let's say, look, okay, the one then like, that I love was up in Tyrone, up in the north. And like Northern Ireland is technically a different country, you know? We're on the same island, but Northern Ireland um, is owned by the UK. Mm -hmm. So it's technically a different country. Um, when we were doing the folklore collection, the Duke's folklore, folklore collection back in the 1930s, they didn't include the six counties in the north because they were of UK rule. So, yeah, there was a lot of, you know, unease about Northern Ireland over the past six, eight hundred years, you know, sure. fighting, fighting you know, for our freedom for a long, long time. And like, we're only a, a nation the last 100 years, like a republic, 100 years, really. So, But I won't get too nationalist about it. But um, up in the north, there's wonderful stories. And this one spe specifically is about a stone called a scalp stone. So up in County Tyrone, there's a hill called Scalp Hill. Back pre-Christian, we had the old Celtic gods. One of them would be Lou, Lou, Lou Longfather, Lou with the long arms. So he was an incredible warrior, um, incredible warrior, warrior god. And he used to be worshipped before Christianity came to Ireland back in the 700s. So they had a festival to do with Lou, um, they called it Lou's Nyasad, so Lou's Assembly. And that was every, the first weekend in August. Um, so the first week, a weekend in August, this festival was held in this area. So they'd ascend the hilltops, they'd light fires, they'd have music, they'd have dancing, matchmaking, they'd have games, um, leaping, running, jumping games. But the highlight of the whole games was the lifting of the scalp stone. Uh -huh. So the scalp stone is a stone that's up at the top of this hill. And you come up to the top of the hill and it, it comes in, it's almost like a, a volcanic hill, like, you know. So it comes up and it, it comes down to like a natural amphitheater. So everyone used to ring around this amphitheater and look down at the games. And the highlight of the whole day was, was lifting up the scalp stone. So um, the scalp stone was, was weighed at 300 weight. So an old 100 weight would be 50 kilos. So it was 150 kilos. So you're talking a, a pre-Christian practice that has been lifted since before Christianity came to Ireland. Wow. Um, and this stone was lifted at, the, at those games. And... It was lifted all the way up until about the 1930s or 1940s. And then because of wars and, like I said, fight for independence and civil war here, it was roundly forgotten. So I went on a pretty famous podcast there about six months ago called The Blind Buy Podcast, which is famous in Ireland and England. And um, I was told about this and I couldn't believe it. I was like, oh, you're telling me there's a stone connected to an ancient Celtic god that's sitting on the top of a hill. That's, <laughs> that's music to your ears. <laughs> Nobody has lifted in almost 80 yeah. years. So um, up I went. And we ascend this hill and it's a beautiful, beautiful place. So you're up at the top of this hill and you're just, you have the whole of Tyrone. Like if you've, you can see four or five counties here and you're just, just blankets of fields everywhere. It's absolutely glorious. And look what happened. It was on the same weekend that it used to be lifted hundreds of years ago. It just happened to be that August that we went up. Um, and as you're in the amphitheater, there's one little kind of cut out part of it. 
and the sun sets down into that cutout part at this particular time of the year. So we were at that time as well. And it was just, it was a very, very spiritual moment. And this, what, what I loved was in Tyrone, because it's, it's, it was, you know, technically under British rule, the Irish language was stamped out, you know. Mm. But it wasn't forgotten because the way to lift a stone was called to smigay. So smigay in Irish, smig means chin and a means it. So to chin it. So if you could chin ah. this stone, um, you were a hero, you know. Wow. Um, again, again, a hero for now, you know, and to be spoken of. So the language is dead in that area, but the story and the language survives through the stone, you know. So um, I went up with some friends of mine from Scotland and we all smigay, we all chinned that stone, um, 150 kilos of it. And it So amazing. there's still local knowledge of where the stone was located? The people who owned the land like, knew all about it. Knew everything oh, about wonderful. It. And this seems to be a running theme, you know, because we are a nation of oral history because we had to have oral history because we weren't allowed to speak Irish. There was to the 16th and 17th centuries, there was a policy to get rid of Irish language, Irish culture and uh, religion by the British. So our pretty much our culture was getting stamped out and eradicated, but people kept it um, through oral history. So they were passing this on father, son, mother, daughter all the way through the years. And it's only over the past, like I said, 50, 60 years that we're starting to be able to bring this back. So to be part of the kind of the reclamation of a bit of culture that was yeah. eradicated almost, to be able to bring something back and give something back to this country that I love is um, is a wonderful, wonderful thing. Absolutely wonderful thing. It is wonderful. Yeah. So you know, speaking of incredible. that, uh, can yeah. you tell me a little bit about your book? Yeah, sure. Um, so you so have a book the that's book. Uh, essentially, you know, it's chronicling this adventure that's correct? exactly what it is it's it's um this one was like the grail diary because people yeah. call me in the phones <laughs> right now so it's like the grail diary it's, um, it's it's everything it's it's from start to finish you know it's how i went to scotland and how like we talked about at the start and mm -hmm. having an idea that maybe it was there and then the research and then finding the first stone and then every chapter then after that is is a stone and how i found it first of all how i researched it Sometimes going through old folklore, sometimes meeting people or hearing old, old tales, reading through old books, yeah. then going to the place, meeting the local person who might know about it, hearing their tales, their, them telling me everything they know about it, but their grandfather or their grandmother mm -hmm. might have lifted it, or their great grandfather back in the day was supposed to have lifted it, but no one has lifted it since. And then they're going to the place, the finding of the stone, how easy or how sometimes you're just walking, there it is at a crossroads. Sometimes it's hacking through a hedge or hacking through a cemetery <laughs> yeah. for two and a half hours with a pillow. And looking for it and then the finding of it, how that felt, the lifting of it, how that felt, and every just everything from start to finish in this whole journey. Um, and I can't wait to share with people because some of the stories are, you know, they're almost magical that they're happenstances and lucky chances and the finding of something or the meeting of the one person in the whole area who knew something about it. And mm -hmm. it just seemed to, it's like the land just wants this stuff back, you know, it's like the land wants the culture back. And I've just been guided uh, almost to, to, to the right place or the right person more times than not, you know, so it's, um, it's been quite the journey and I can't wait to share it, you know? So, and has the book been published yet or no? Not yet. I've, I've been talked yeah. to a publisher at the moment and okay. it's been sent off okay. to four or five prospective publishers. Um, I had to get an agent. Wonderful. Which was, an agent. Yeah. That's uh, the whole process. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, so, like, well, I, I mean, I think listeners have gotten a, a preview of the book. Yeah these past, you know, 20 minutes hearing some of these stories. So it, it certainly piques my interest. I'd love to read it. So uh, make sure listeners that you follow David on his social media and things so that you don't miss when that does come out. Uh, do you have a title for the book yet? Sure. Um, so the title of the book, I'm thinking of calling it uh, The Wind Under It, because Wonderful. it's the way of describing the lift in Ireland, you know, getting the Gwe Fui or the Gwe Seir Fui, the free wind under it. Um, is a way of describing the lift, and I think it's a beautiful, poetic way of, of talking about but stone lifting. So the wind under it, unearthing an Irish culture. I, I do a, a tiny bit of stone lifting compared to you. I mean, I have a couple atlas stones. I have some natural stones mm. in my backyard, and like I said, I go hiking. But my main strength pursuit is grip strength, and I love awesome. seeing the grip work that you do. It looks like you're in your yard where you have some yeah. uh, stones about bigger than a shot put, but you know, yeah. maybe 15, 16 pounds, and uh, you're just trying to grip them, trying to pick them up. But when you say the wind under it, I, it's funny. I, I reflect on some of my grip strength training, and when I'm able to lift something for the first time, and it's not a full deadlift to lock out, 
I can't mm. stand up with it, but I just get just get it off the ground because a lot of times with grip strength, uh, the blob or the Thomas Inch dumbbell, whatever it is, is just glued to the ground. It won't budge. Yeah. So yeah. just that very first time, I'm almost more excited that very first little inch getting some air under it than I am when mm -hmm. I finally lift it all the way to lockout. So that's yeah, a wonderful yeah. title. That's great. Thanks, man. Yeah, I appreciate that. And it's, it's a nice way of nice way of doing it, isn't it? Especially like when you understand it like that with the grip strength. Yeah, it's the same thing. It's it's, it's oh, a yeah. lovely title. You know? So then, uh, yeah. Speaking of that, so the grip strength in your yard, you're using stones. I mean, at this point, are are you still training with kettlebells, or is have you implemented yeah. stones in all your training? Um, I, I have a friend of mine comes here every Wednesday, and we train. Um, specifically kettlebells you know mm. because he's um he's in a, a, the total opposite of me he's an endurance runner oh but okay. um well we, we train a lot of split squats we train a lot of um push press for shoulders you know we train a lot of heavy heavy swings um rows just like basic basic movements but just getting started and just a lot a lot of split squats lots of bulgarian squats with, with heavy bells um and he's <laughs> absolutely because he's he does mountain running and he's absolutely flying through the mountains with these split squats, you know, and he's, he feels like, I feel like a gazelle running through these mountains, you know, yeah. especially going up, <laughs> you know, because just that, that, that strength, that single leg and lateral strength, you know. So, and it, obviously that helps me in my, in my lifting as well, you know, heavy split squats. I mean, for, to get that extension, when you have that, that stone in your lap to stand up to full extension, you have that strength yeah. in your quads and strength in your glutes. It's, it's, um, it's a wonderful movement, you know, it sucks. <laughs> yeah. It sucks to do, yeah. but uh, yeah, it's, yeah. it's a wonderful movement. So like we train that and it's, it's a good way to getting cardio for me as well, because, I haven't been doing half or a third as much cardio as I used to be doing, but everything I used to be doing with kettlebell force was just all cardio, cardio, cardio. Mm. This is a totally different way of training. It's just pure brute force, you know? So it's been a really interesting way to see how your body kind of reacts to stimulus over the past couple of years, because I went from that just being a cardio machine to just lifting something heavy a few times in training. But um, just that you can do that switch. You know, I'm not a young man, I'm 45, and you can do that switch and still get gains in that direction when you, you know, you train correctly and you train I suppose safely as well, you know? Yeah, it comes together. It works. One helps the other. And I, at the top of the show, I remember you mentioning that you were in kettlebell sports. So prior to the stones, um, you know, how did you get involved with kettlebells and kettlebell sport? That means you, you were competitive, correct? Mm. Yeah. So, um, so I don't know much 40s. about that. How does that work? Sure. So, um, I go back to the start, like in my 30s, I was very unfit and very unhealthy. So I started running at the age of 31 and I was very unfit. You know, I was well over 220 pounds um, and just in a bad place. And just started running, couldn't run to the top of my yard, or top of my estate, I should say, like for the first time. But eventually, after about, about two, three months, I was getting 5K, 10K runs, mm. starting to feel healthy, starting to feel better. And then um, I ran my first marathon after six months. After the marathon, I was like, okay, that was kind of like a real epiphany moment for me. I was like, right, you have to do something difficult. You're young, still relatively young in your early 30s. What can you do next? And I just through pure fluke, I ended up in a kettlebell gym, um, the only one in my county of Waterford. I ended up in this gym and I was doing kettlebell hit classes and just standard kettlebell classes. And it was the only gym in the southeast of Ireland that was also doing kettlebell sport. Hmm. So kettlebell sport is, is two kettlebells, one in each hand, uh, clean and jerk for 10 minutes straight, right? So it's two kettlebells, okay. clean and jerk nonstop for 10 minutes straight. So you imagine how attrition that is in the cardio. Oh, yeah. So the novice, the, the novice, the beginner was 216s for 10 minutes. Um, and that took a while to build up to because kettlebell um, cardio is a totally different thing than running cardio. Like running was a day off. You know, kettlebell cardio was really, really intense, especially long cycle, the clean jerk that I was doing. So... I won my first comp, I think, after about, about eight months of training, my first novice comp. Like, I'd never won anything in my life before that. I wasn't a sporty person in my 20s. So I was like, I won something. I can't believe it. I bet yeah. five guys. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a gold medal winner, you know. I'll never forget yeah. it. I'm so happy. I was like, fuck. <laughs> and um, but it was like, right, how far can I take this? You know, because people are saying, look, your body's shape suits kettlebells. You know, you got long arms. You got a short torso. You can get that rest and rack position. You can get that nice straight arms overhead. You know, you got good mobility. I think you could, you know, you can go as far as you want to go. So I, I saw the European Championships were just down there, held down the road for me in Wexford in mm. 2013, I think. And I went down to watch those guys lifting 232s, the Russians and the Ukrainians, the um, the Kazakhs, you know, and all lifting 232 kilo kettlebells for 10 minutes straight and getting massive wow. numbers. I was like, how does anybody do that? Yeah. <laughs> 232s, long cycle, clean and jerk, nonstop, uh -huh. maybe 100, 100 reps, 10 reps a minute, nonstop. I was like, 
It's that's incredible. Incredible. That's just how can a human body do that? So I got just obsessed with with technicality. I got obsessed with technique and mm. mobility. How can I get better? And I got on the Irish team in twenty fourteen on two twenty fours, and came fourth in the worlds, um, and came first in the Europeans. So it was like that was just incredible. You know, it's like here I am, brand new with the sport. I'm in Russia, Saint Petersburg. I just won the Europeans. You know, how did that fucking happen? Like three yeah. years ago. I couldn't want to talk about your state. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's just going to show you quickly you can turn stuff around. And the next year, the following year then, I came forth by one rep and I knew that my cleans were bad. My cleans were a little bit off and I was wasting a little bit of time. And every second counts when you're doing something like that in 10 minutes. So I, I got my efficiency better. And mm -hmm. I went down and I won the Worlds in 2015 in Dublin, in my home my home, home, home country, you know. Oh, extraordinary. And, a moment. and uh, from there, then I went up to the, the professional mates, 232s competed and came fifth in the world on 232s which was an incredible thing to do um especially at the age i was at i think i was 37 38 at that stage so to stand up with the best athletes in the world in the sport i was over in kazakhstan and competing professionally for my country you know it was absolutely just an amazing amazing experience so that was incredible but i think the thing i'm most most proud of is i don't i set a world record in 2019 um two 16 kilo kettlebells clean and jerk non-stop for two hours um, mm. which is a sport record that still stands. Nobody has attempted it since. Um, two hours. Two hours straight. Oh, my goodness. Um, without a break. So 634 reps straight with two sixteen clean and jerk, um, oh. which nobody, nobody has beaten yet. So still very proud of that because that's like five, almost six years ago now. So like endurance wise, I, I mean, what's the, what's the recovery like after that? <laughs> I yeah, can only imagine you your hands, your back, your legs. I mean, oh, my goodness. Let me tell you, man, I, I, I was fucking flying. I, I was in the gym and I was like, I was meant to do a 90 minute set as my last mm -hmm. set to go do this because I was doing it um, on professional guidelines, uh, professional judges and getting it properly recorded. So to go down the history books. So three weeks beforehand, I went to do 90 minutes and I felt so good in the gym. I'd done the two hours in the gym and I shouldn't have, you know, it's like, don't run a marathon before you're on a marathon. You know what I mean? Yeah. But yeah. I, did it I felt great. So I did it anyway. And it was like, um, my hands, you know, my hands were just tore asunder from sweat and chalk. My legs were in bits. My body was just, and then I had to go back to work the next day and stuff, you know? And yeah. so I shouldn't have done that. But I mean, three weeks later, I went up and I done it again in the, uh, <laughs> officially, <laughs> officially this time. Wow. Um, in, a, in a shopping center up in Port Leash in front okay. of eight professional judges. Um, but I did it. I did it. Um, like I said, the recovery was tough. Like your hands. Is there anything? Your... Are you wearing anything on your hands or is it just no. chalk? No, just, chalk. Something. just chalk. Oh, wow. That's, yeah. Yeah. So, um, like, I'm, like, my technique is, I, I pride myself my technique was always very, very good because I could put a thousands and thousands and thousands of reps, like hundreds and thousands of reps into my technique training. Mm. But it's just the amount of sweat and chalk. It's like, it's like anything. If you if you if you run an ultra marathon, it's going to be collateral damage. If you oh, do yeah. something like this, it's going to be collateral damage. You know, so my my hands were, were bloody and the skin was after coming off the palms. Oh. Um, my feet just wanted to walk away by themselves. At the end, they were just so sore because it's like six hundred thirty four uh, calf raises. You know, yeah. weight, weight. So oh. um, you go out and do a hundred calf raises with two sixteen. You're feeling like, and now do another five hundred thirty four after yeah, that. You know? Forget about Without it. Without a break. That's... That's not for yeah. me. <laughs> it, was, yeah, it, was, it was just something I'm proud of. Like, I wanted to just, yeah, just, just to incredible. see could it be done. Because people are saying that it's impossible to do it. You know, when I say this, like I said, that it's well, impossible. It's, it can't it's, be done. It's, it's hard not to, uh, for me, hearing your story, not to draw a connection between things you're doing now. You know, these feet of strengths with the stones. And can it yeah. be done? Can you find this, you know, ancient stone yeah. and lift it? But a big difference would be just the head-to-head -head competition aspect of kettlebell sport that, you know, you're competing against yourself with these natural stones. Yeah, exactly. That's what it's like. I mean, for me, once I'd set done the goals, I mean, like I, I hit won the world champion, won the European championship nationals, you know, I set the world record and it's like, that's it. I don't need to do anything else. Competitive edges now blunted. I've done everything I wanted to do mm -hmm. in a sport. And so now this is just for me. So this is just, it's you now against the stone. You know, it's you against the stone is always there. The stone is always ways the same. So what do you need to do? Yeah. You get better at lifting it, you know. The stone yeah. will always weigh the same. So it's like when I went there first to the Milan stone, it was like it felt impossible because it was a hundred, like it's one hundred and seventy-one kilos, and it's it's granite, you know. And you're out in the middle of you're after traveling a fair distance to get to it. You have to cycle twenty-five minutes to get to it, like up and down hills, and it's tough enough to get to the thing. Wow! And then you have to go lift it, you know. 
So it, it's, a, it's a difficult thing to get to. Um, and then you have to be strong enough to pick up 171 kilos off the grass, you know? Um, so first time I done it, I was like, I saw my friend Jamie Garion do it, who'd be a, a power lifter. He's a very, very big, very strong man. He's like 130 kilos almost and six foot three and he's massive. Just you know, that big blocky strong, you know? Yeah. Whereas yeah. I was from an endurance weight background, like I was 74 kilos with yeah. six, 6% six body fat. I was absolutely just nothing, a machine to lift. Yeah. So I had to go back on a lot of weight to lift that stone because like the stone is there. So what do you have to do to get better to lift it? So I had to get stronger. I had to get bigger. It's a different discipline get, for sure. It's a different it's discipline. Not, so then like, I had to go down that yeah. road of that discipline of training heavy, but maybe only twice a week, but training really fucking heavy. And well, like you said before, more. it's like when you find this stone, that's your max rep that's your that's your one that's rep it. max that you're trying that's to it. attempt so you're not doing this for two hours you know nope. so it's a it's just apples and oranges yeah it's the to yeah it's totally opposite but it's been so mm -hmm. much fun um going that's from that your insurance background to this and like i said getting to a fairly decent level in both and just mm -hmm. going to show you that you can at the age of 45 still yeah. get stronger you know i'm the strongest i've ever been in my life now you know and I only wish I'd done this 20 years ago. You know what yeah, I mean? but, yeah. I'm 43 but, um, and I feel the same that I, yeah, man, I, I honestly, just, uh, just, I would, if I met my 20 year old self, I'd kind of laugh at myself. <laughs> same. So yeah, yeah. I was just drinking and smoking and messing. Yeah, exactly. Like so I'd <laughs> shake my head, but <laughs> when it comes to the history and recording the history, so I, you know, you've awoken this history that yeah. was there long before you and, you know, you've, you've played this role in, in bringing it to light and, and uh, bringing it more to uh, pe more people's attention, I guess I'd say. Mm. And hopefully when the book comes out, that chronicles it as well. But is there a website or something that tracks any of these stones, whether it be Ireland, Scotland, uh, Iceland? Yeah. There's a couple of different websites. I mean, I have so much going on at the moment, but like, there's a website called Old Man of the Stones, which is dedicated to oh. the American. So yes. if you want yes. going to old man of the stones, it is all the lifting stones pretty much. It I has have it only has about before. ten or twelve in Ireland. I mean, I have forty four found now. Okay. Um, so I, they, that really needs to get updated. But I mean, like between because like I'm the only person doing this. Like I'm there isn't an evening or a weekend or lunchtime they're not talking to somebody. You know, yesterday yeah. I'm like I'm shooting a, like a sixty minute documentary for national TV now, which is massive. You know, I'm starting that next week. Oh, so that's, that's wonderful. a 60 minute doc on national TV. They're going to be releasing that in the United States yeah. um, in, in cinemas. That's coming up. I mean, I'm, I'm doing a TED talk in three months. I'm writing that. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, appearing on big podcasts, writing the book. Yeah. So it's like, I'm literally just nonstop trying to get this culture out. I'm talking to somebody all the time. Then it then like still researching stones, finding new ones, traveling there, lifting them, meeting people, getting stories. So, it, it can be a bit mentally jarring. It can be like, there's a lot involved, you know, you're the only person doing it. You're that whole, that, that access that everything has to go through, you know, so everybody mm -hmm. wants to talk to you. So um, I'm really, really busy with it. But the most rewarding thing about it is it's just seeing the whole culture come back, you know, because it was dead, it was gone. Well, yeah. it was just the embers were burning. That's all. But I mean, yeah. there isn't a day goes by where I'm not getting a picture of somebody going to lift one of these stones. And that's one or, you know, someone talking about it or somebody wanting to talk to you online and say, look, I'm coming over in the summer. So it's it's back and it's back with a vengeance. You know, it's really, really flying now. And it's nice to say, yeah, I done that. You know, yeah. I started that. I didn't wow. begin the whole thing, but I mean, I brought it back from the brink. And now it's, it's in the national consciousness again. Now people are proud of it and they want to do it again. And they want to document it and they want to talk shit. It's wonderful. I, I mean, it intrigues me. And I think it's... Uh it's an interesting uh, aspect of the culture that was dormant that is now, you know, coming back thanks to your hard work. And certainly when I take my family to Ireland and we go on vacation, I I'll, uh, I'll be looking for some stones. That's for sure. Yeah, man, hit me up. Hit me I up will. if you're over, you know, if I can I meet will. you. It's, uh, it's on, it's definitely on the top of my wife and I, our list, our travels that we want to take the kids and, uh, and go see so yeah we'll, oh man you gotta come over here when we make it to ireland i'll i'll she knows already she <laughs> she are, she already knows that i'll be taking uh some excursions and going off to find some stones and things because so, like it's yeah. you're getting the parts like you're getting to parts of ireland that people really should get to you know i mean I, i'm getting the parts of ireland i've never seen before and i'm like i'm so yeah. happy i went there you know because like, you're getting out of the cities you get to the absolutely real. 
And that's the thing. I think if people, if they go through your Instagram and look at some of your posts, the thing that I pick up on after a while following you is uh, it's not just a stone. It's it's the context of it. It's it's where it is. And like you said, it's it's everything surrounding it. And a, a lot of times it's beautiful. It's an yeah. absolutely yeah. gorgeous surrounding that you're lifting the stone in. So it's, it's, um, it's all encompassing. Exactly. It's not just a stone. It's a story, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, it's not just a stone in the field. Like there's a whole history attached to it. Yeah. Sometimes there's also there's history, there's folklore and there's mythology attached to it. Every single one of them has a story. And then, like I said, you're going to these absolutely incredibly beautiful parts of the country. You know, West yeah. Galway, you go to West Clare, to the Bourne, you go to the islands off the, the West Coast. Um, monastic islands that like monks lived on 600 years ago, you know, and you're lifting these stones that the monks used to lift or you're lifting these Balon stones onto altars or you're you're getting in touch with with ancient mythologies like like you said Ku Cullen or the Fiend or Fiona Cool. It's not just a stone. The stone is almost a small, just a small part of it. It's just yeah. one part of it, you know. Yeah. It's the physical part of it, but there's this whole folklore, cultural and kind of mystical part of it as well. I think it's uh, extraordinary. And I do follow up posts on my social uh, media and various outlets so as those things you just mentioned the ted talks in the near term that's coming up soon mm -hmm. but then the documentary that you're shooting should come you know a little bit further down the path and hopefully yeah. the book yeah. as well i'll make sure to update my followers awesome. and my listeners so that they can keep up with you oh, that's uh, great. where else can everybody find you yeah i mean just i mean where i do most of my work now is just on instagram um, okay I got, I got a very big following well, not very big but i mean a big follow yeah. on instagram now and um, that one's Indiana Stones. Um, and yeah. that's what I was nicknamed about two years ago. So I, said, I love oh, the name. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> because it, it, it makes sense. Because yeah. I feel like half the time, I feel like I'm, I'm on an adventure. <laughs> you know? I'm on ironically going on quests on weekends. Yeah. Because yeah. I mean, like just there last weekend, say, I mean, I went up to the island of Isla off the west coast of, sorry, uh -huh. off the north, northeast coast of Ireland, between Ireland and Scotland. There's this okay. island called Isla, which if you're into whiskey, you know Isla. Um, and we found the bridging stone between both the Irish and the Scottish culture geographically last weekend. So like right in the middle of both Scotland and Ireland is this island and there's a lifting stone on there and there's a whole history about it. So to me, that was like that, that bridge between both cultures. And it was like a very, very important find, you know, um, I'm writing about that in the book actually at the minute. I, I had finished the book, but I was like, I have to put this in there. Yeah. <laughs> I have to, because like it, it's that, that like this geographical and cultural link between both both ancient cultures, because like I was speaking, like I speak a bit of Irish, you know, um, as Bradham and Changa, and I was talking to guys who speak Gaelic on the Hebridean islands of Scotland, and okay. they speak the exact same Gaelic as I do, you know, it's like just speaking to someone like in a regional dialect, so it's like, I could chat away to those guys in Gaelic, and they could chat away to me, so like, we're the same people, we're yeah, the exact same yeah. people, we're just separated by like 25 miles, that's all it is from Ireland to this island. So we're the exact same people. So it was wonderful to find that stone and the history. Yeah, and and that's, to taste all and, of the lovely whiskeys overnight, like, because my God. Yeah, yeah that man. doesn't hurt either, you know. <laughs> that's not a oh, bad, not, uh, Yeah, that's not a, that's not a bad uh, little set to the trip as well. And no, it's no. it kind of, um, for your personal journey, that stone bridging the Irish and the Scottish, that plays a little part too, because you you kicked off this journey by kind of, looking at those documentaries and learning about the Scottish stones, learning about the Icelandic stones. So that's interesting. That's too. Sort of kind, of, kind of moment. Yeah. Yeah. I'd actually, yeah. Yeah, actually, now that you mentioned, I hadn't even thought of that. Yeah. So yeah, it's, that, uh, that's nice. it's, it's interesting. Full to, moment, uh, really. Yeah. Yeah. Come around and relatively, I mean, we're talking as if you've been doing this 40 years, you know, the COVID shutdown was 2020. It's been four years. So you, you've yeah. covered a lot of ground in four years. Right. It's, really, it's only about two and a half years, you know, and mm -hmm. what I love about this is like, I haven't gone looking for any notoriety or mm -hmm. publicity from this at all. I was just doing this for myself to see because I thought it was just a noble thing to do. It's a, it's a good thing to do. You're bringing back yeah. a bit of culture. But because I think you went in this with that humility and, you know, kind of egalitarian attitude, it's like people are kind of saying, oh, hold on, what this fellow is doing is actually important. And everything that's come from it, like I said, the TED Talk and the book and RT and, and go on the telly. And I was on the biggest TV show in Ireland there a couple of months ago. And it's just happened organically. And it's been amazing, to be honest with you. Um, yeah. But I think people like were like, this fellow is passionate about this. So I think passion comes across. So whether it's somebody picking up a stone off the ground, and people might think that's mad, but 
<laughs> or like, or, you know, but, but if you can speak about it passionately, you speak about it in terms of culture coming back, it made people kind of stand up and listen, you know, and um, there's this whole cultural resurgence happening here now as well in Ireland. It's, I'm just kind of part of that. The language is coming mm. back, the mythologies are coming back, the old folklore is coming back. And these old ways, there's a hunger for them. And I just, I think this just hit at the right time. But it, yeah, it's it's gone almost stratospheric in the past six months, especially um, with the likes of like, I mean, a 60 minute documentary being made about me. You yeah. know, that's like, it's <laughs> mad. <laughs> you know, I'm still working my normal yeah. shop, job in the shop and I've been there 20 yeah, yeah. years and it's like, all of a sudden you're becoming this almost like a cult icon in Ireland, you know? Yeah. Which is almost very fucking strange to even say that out loud. Yeah. But people yeah. are phoning me, like they're sending me messages all the time, or sending me art or pictures or, you know, thank yous and you know, we really appreciate you and thanks so much for doing what you're doing. And it's it's a bit strange. Um it's a little bit jarring, but it's it's totally wonderful as well because people well, mis- to respect to the connect uh, to to make a metaphor, it's it reminds me of what you said with approaching the stone that your your footing might be off. Mm. You, you know, you have all these elements, and uh, so metaphorically, that's what it sounds like you're in right now. You know, you're approaching some ground you haven't yet experienced, but uh, mm. you know, something tells me you have the strength. So, yeah, please God, I mean, I give it my best shot anyway. You know, yeah. um, you know, be, you're being thrown into the limelight a little bit. You know, yeah, but. Like just roll it because like, yeah. just do what you can with it, you know, because you're doing it for the right reasons. Well, that's why I'm hoping my listeners, uh, when they hear your story, I hope they check you out and I hope that it inspires them too. When they go on a hike, when they, in their communities and their, you know, where they live to, to look around and, you know, well, just have yeah. a go at it and pick up a natural stone and see what they can do. Because, uh, yeah, it's, it's there's something just simplistic and primal and just, I don't know, just, uh, it's so primal. I mean, it's part of yeah. who we are. It goes all yeah. the way back. I mean, the stone lifting documented yeah. all the way back to ancient Greece, ancient Rome through all the ancient indigenous cultures. Yeah. You know, so I, I can guarantee you, if you look hard enough in your local area, if you really delve deep enough, I'm sure you'll yeah. find something there as well. Oh, there's a stone lifter on the other side of Pennsylvania from me who he, um, he, he, he does similar things to you, but he also, he scouts out stones and he, he maps them. He'll drop a, a pin in a Google map and show where it is. And he'll name them if he successfully oh. lifted it. And he's a keystone lifter. I believe he goes by. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm friends with him online. Yeah. 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 So keystone, that's a Pennsylvania. That's the state in the United States awesome. that I live in. And on the other side of it is a keystone lifter. And yeah, he's, he's extraordinary. He'll, he'll go around, he'll find this stone and he hasn't lifted yet or he'll revisit ones. He'll go to, uh, different sites, you know, battle sites and things historically that, uh, are now monuments and things and, and find different stones. And yeah, he's an interesting oh, guy. It's just fantastic. Because, I mean, every, every stone story has to start somewhere, you know? So exactly. So he's starting new stories time. sometimes, exactly. which is it great. It's like someone like, yeah. like the old man pl- planting an acorn, you know, it's like, he'll never see the tree, but he's doing something for the right yeah, reasons. Yeah. And in 50 years' time, that would, people keep visiting us, so that would be a historic looking stone, you know? Why not? I mean, the hike I'm taking my children on, if there's a creek that uh, you cross over, and I know for a fact there's this large stone that sits under there and that I've lifted it before. And uh, my kids like the Trolls movies, you know, little cartoon yes, Trolls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that I guarantee they're going to be, you know, joking about looking for Trolls and things. So even if it's just in your family, it's a, you know, it's a fun adventure. It's a fun adventure. It's a rite of passage. I mean, and what you could do, because the boys up in the, the Edmonton stones yeah. are trained up in Canada, they have the, like a, a map of, the, of new lifting stones that people – who, like who find a decent lifting stone in their area and want, want to name it and want to weigh it. Yeah. And you can put that on the map and then it's there forever. You know so I mean? Maybe something you could try. Yeah. Give it a shot. Well, listeners, please, if you've ever lifted up a natural stone, drop a comment and tell us. I'll drop all of David's information in the description. Make sure you follow him if you don't already. And David, thank you so much for coming on Home Gym History. I really appreciate it. My pleasure, Rob. Thanks for having me on, man. All right. Thank you.